All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. This is a great honor for me. I've been kind of dreaming about this moment for three years, and a lot of training and dedication has gone into preparing this talk. So we got a lot to cover today. Now, essentially, my role in chiropractic school was setting this upper cervical and understanding why the work that we do has the effects that it does. And through understanding how the upper cervical complex works and understanding the pathologies associated with the subluxation, it gave me a deep, deep fear of the atlas subluxation content. And that is what motivates me towards efficient removal of it. And efficient removal and maintenance of the removal of the subluxation is what brought me to advanced orthogonal, because I believe this is the best procedure we have for getting rid of this thing and making sure it goes. And that's my motivation, because I'm so afraid of it. And my goal today is to make you afraid of it, too. So. Um, basically, when I was in chiropractic school, I was already studying the upper cervical work, but Dr. Carrick came to Life West, delivered a one-hour presentation about functional neurology, which really piqued my interest. So I started doing the, his neurology program on the weekends while in chiropractic school. I did that for about two and a half years. Graduated chiropractic school, got my diploma in neurology, moved out here, and I've been here for eight months, and it's been quite of a journey. So. We got a lot to cover. I could go on for about three hours, but we only get one hour. We got a lot to cover, not much time, so go ahead and buckle your seatbelts because we're going to get going. It's going to be fast. So this is the first one. Our perception of our universe is not a true representation of our physical universe, but a mental construct composed by our mind's interpretation of all of the integrated nervous input available to it at any given moment. And that's so neat, because what I see isn't the same as what you see. What we think about this world isn't actually what's happening in the world. But through different receptor systems all over our body, we're able to gather information about the world. And all of that goes through these thousands of nerve fibers into the brain, and that's where we form our perception of what is actually happening. And everything you'll ever feel, experience, think, all of it happens in the brain. Okay? If you stub your toe and the toe hurts, you don't actually hurt your toe. Areas in your brain representing the somatosensory maps of that toe are what are lighting up with this pain. And that's where you actually feel it, is in the brain. Everything happens through the brain. And this is the most amazing structure in the universe because it is 100 billion neurons. Each neuron has 100,000 synaptic connections, and each neuron is doing about 100,000 chemical reactions per second. Okay, If you multiply all those together, it's nearly infinite. And together, they work in perfect harmony to control the 100 trillion cells of our body at every moment of every single day. And so I begin this talk with a deep appreciation and understanding of the complexity of the nervous system, and this is what motivated me to study it. Now, over the summer when I was preparing, I read this little gem, which is Functional Neurology for Man Practitioners of Manual Therapy. It's a great book written by Randy Beck, and it's basically about the Functional Neurology program. And there's a lot of really important information in it that we need to use to reference some definitions leading us into this talk. Everything is coming from essentially chapter one of this book. So let's get going. The central integrative state of a neuron is a total integrated input received by the neuron at any given moment, and the probability that that neuron will produce an action potential based on the state of polarization and the firing requirements of the neuron to produce action potentials at one or more of its axons. The concept of central integrative state is described above in relation of a single neuron can be extrapolated to a group of neurons. And what this means is that the central integrative state of a neuron really depicts the health of it. How much inputs coming in, activation or inhibition that will cause processing within that neuron. It's buzzing, okay? Is it buzzing at a high level or a low level? A high central integrative state or a low central integrative state? You want your neurons to be functioning at a high central integrative state. Lots of information coming in, lots of processing going on, and then correct output to it. Now, this is referring to one neuron. But what Carrick says is that you can extrapolate it to a functional group of neurons. And that means that instead of saying, when we're looking at central integrative state, instead of saying just one neuron in that vestibular nucleus isn't working, we can extrapolate that the entire pool is going through a similar change as well, which is very, very important. 
a constant stimulus pathways are neural receptive systems that supply constant input into the neural axis that are integrated throughout all the multimodal systems to provide stimulus necessary for the development and maintenance of systems. So what this means is that to maintain the central integrative state within the brain, you have to have input coming in, firing all the time to keep those neurons running. If you lose that input and they lose that, their central integrative state will, will dip. And so your brain is relying upon what we call constant stimulus pathways, information that's always feeding in, almost like um, gasoline to an engine. Okay. Now, we get a lot of different input to the brain through different sensory pathways, right? There's visual stimulus to the brain, there's hearing that comes into the brain, there's taste, but all of those are non-constant pathways, right? We go to sleep for eight hours, we don't see anything, we don't hear anything, we're losing that activation to the brain. And so the brain central integrative state would weaken during sleep if not for constant stimulus pathways things that are always firing into the brain. And the only one that we really have is proprioception. Examples of constant stimulus pathways include receptors that detect the effects of gravity or constant motion, namely the joint and muscle position receptors of joint capsules, muscle spindles, and the axial. And that's what's neat, is that this proprioceptive system we have is the only constant stimulus pathway that's always firing into the brain, always keeping it going. And because of that, the brain is reliant upon proprioception from the body. If you cut that off, the brain loses that activation, its central integrative state begins to fall, and it starts to get weak and or sick. And thus, this is how Carrick says that the spine has vital important proprioceptive to keep the brain running nice and healthy. Immediate early genes okay, are activated by a variety of second messenger systems in the neuron in response to membrane stimulus. If the cell does not produce enough protein, the cell cannot perform the necessary functions to the extent required for optimal performance and or to sustain its very life. In situations where the neuron has not had adequate supplies of either oxygen, nutrients, or stimulus, the manufacturing of proteins is down-regulated and the process of degeneration refers to as transneural degeneration. Very important word, okay? What this means is that when we're talking about a neuron, it basically needs three things to survive. Oxygen, food, stimulus. If it loses one of the three, the neuron's gonna get sick. And that's why for me, when I'm treating a patient's nervous system, all three of them are important to me, okay? If they have an oxygen deficit, there's a very easy solution to that, and that is exercise. Exercise is gonna increase their oxygen delivery, okay? Quitting smoking, CoQ10, hyperbaric chambers and extreme examples, all ways to increase oxygen delivery to the nervous system. Okay, nutrition as well. If the neurons don't have the fundamental building blocks, then they won't be able to make the proteins and structures they need. And that's why if somebody's eating Taco Bell all day, you can adjust them. They're not gonna get better as long as they don't have the fundamental building blocks. And that's why I feel obligated to at least talk about nutrition a little bit or refer to a dietitian. But what our specialty is, is, is the stimulus. And the stimulus is very important because when one neuron releases neurotransmitters at the surface of another neuron, that activates second messenger systems, okay? There's receptors on the surface that capture that, and they start to release a protein into the cytoplasm, which goes into the nucleus of that neuron, and that starts to activate the DNA. And what it does is it causes the DNA to start cranking out proteins, proteins that you're gonna need to use for every function of that cell, every function of that neuron, okay? Maybe it's gonna upregulate neurotransmitter production, maybe it will upregulate proteins that are transferring ions in and out. But either way, when we stimulate a neuron, we get these immediate early genes to start replication of proteins, and those proteins are vital for the health of that neuron, okay? If you take away either the stimulation, the oxygen, or the nutrition, and it stops making the proteins, then the cell gets sick, and that sickness is called transneural degeneration. Very, very important term. I'm gonna be using it for the rest of this talk. TND. Diascasis. Diascasis.
Metastasis refers to the process of degeneration of a downstream neuronal system in response to a decrease in stimulus from an upstream neuronal system. So the classic example in neurology is a stroke of the left cortex. Okay, left cortex sends a lot of information to the right cerebellum. That right cerebellum is in, needs that input to keep it running and thriving. So some people have these strokes in their left brain, and it's pretty well documented that by having that stroke, killing this group of neurons, you're going to lose input to that cerebellum, and that cerebellum can also get weaker as a side effect through diascasis. Problems right here affecting things right here that are relying on that incoming information. And this is so important to us. Diascasis is the most important word that chiropractors need to know and are never taught in chiropractic school because it explains why subluxation does what it does. Interference or disruption in one part of the nervous system can impact other parts of the neuro network. And that means that if there is a problem right over here in the spine and it's causing a loss of input up to the brain, parts of that brain that are relying on that input through diascasis will also get weaker. Are we following? And so through the terms, I've built this sentence that says subluxation through diaschetic changes causes transneural degeneration in the brain. Does it make sense? I want us to all say that out loud because it's very important, all right? Ready? One, two, three. Subluxation through diaschetic changes causes transneural degeneration in the brain. All right? Subluxations are killers, in my opinion. They're slow, very slow ones, but they do because they disrupt input into the brain, and that brain is relying on that input through those constant stimulus pathways. We're following? We're following. Okay. Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity results when changes in the physiological function of the neuroaxis occur in response to changes in the internal or external milieu. And basically what this means is that there is hope. There is hope for this brain of ours because it has something called neuroplasticity. And when you fire a part of the brain and you use it, your brain realizes that that's something that needs to be strong. And what it does is it begins to have these immediate early gene responses to crank out proteins. And those proteins are going to help that neuron go through neuroplasticity to grow new synaptic connections to other neurons. Not only will it grow new synaptic connections, but it will increase the ATP production in that neuron so that physically it functions better, but also chemically it's functioning more efficiently. And that way, things that we use frequently actually get stronger. The way I think about it is tennis, okay? You will go and play tennis for the very first time, you're terrible, but you fire that pathway, that tennis pathway through the brain and you begin to have neuroplastic changes. You do that every day repeatedly. That pathway goes through neuroplasticity, gets stronger, gets stronger, gets stronger, and all of a sudden you're good at tennis. So neuroplasticity, in my opinion, is the equivalent of innate intelligence because it allows us to adapt to our environment every single day. It's our brain's ability to adapt to things that are changing. And so um, this is kind of the mechavitalism concept of using the mechanisms to reinforce a vitalistic philosophy that that we understand. Neuroplasticity. So we need to talk about our first research study. And this is Dr. Carrick's Pride and Glory, the blind spot study. Is everybody familiar with this research paper? No. no. That I think this is one of the most important research papers in chiropractic. And this is how it went, was Dr. Carrick was taking blind spots. And do we know what blind spots are, right? Every person, you have your optic receptors, they gather into that optic nerve and exit the eyeball on the medial surface. And where that optic nerve is exiting, there are no receptors there, so you're actually blind. Right, exactly. So everybody, for if they close their left eye, slightly, about 30 degrees to the right, they've got a blind spot right about there, okay? Now when both eyes are open, you don't see any, it, it looks totally fine. And the reason why is that this eye can actually see that visual field, so there's nothing there. You don't perceive it. But when we close one eye, 
we still don't perceive that blind spot right there. And the reason why is that the brain has this ability called filling in. And essentially what it means is that the brain can help predict what would be in there and it actually can fill that area in so that we don't perceive it. Pretty incredible brain functioning right there. But this blind spot of ours is particularly susceptible to the color red. It doesn't do red very well. And so Dr. Carrick, what he would do was he began measuring the size of the blind spots on people. We would have them look at a point, he would take a red dot out here, it would disappear, it would reappear, and he was able to graph the size of the blind spot on each side for these people. Now he did this about like 500 times and the first thing he proved was that measuring blind spots is reliable and reproducible. Okay, it's a good procedure to do. Then what he started noticing was that they were asymmetrical. A lot of people had a larger right blind spot or a larger left blind spot. And that didn't exactly make sense because the optic nerve is the same size on both sides. And this is what he started to understand or think was that if the blind spot on the right was bigger than the one on the left, it was because this left brain was not efficient at filling that one in. And so that this left brain had a lower central integrative state than the right brain. So what Dr. Carrick did was he began a series of manipulations. Essentially what he would do was he would adjust C2 on one side using a diversified type adjustment, okay? My opinion, I think he chose C2 to A, thwart upper cervical chiropractic. He didn't want to actually just give it to us that easily. But nonetheless, if you're doing a diversified adjustment on C2, you're going to move C1, right? There's ligaments in there. There's muscles holding it together. Exactly, exactly. And so what he started to understand was that if they had a large right blind spot, they had a decreased left brain. And when he adjusted their neck on the right side, he would cause input to that left brain and its thalamus would start to function better and the blind spot got smaller, reproducibly. If they had a large right blind spot, adjusting on the right made it get smaller. Alternatively, if he adjusted on the left side, what would happen was that input would go to the right brain and it would cause a frequency of firing in that right brain to go up to make the discrepancy in brain activation bigger and then the blind spot got larger. And that's what he found, reproducibly. If you adjust it on the same side of the large blind spot, it got smaller. If you adjust it on the opposite side, it got larger, okay? And so there's a lot of really important things we can glean from this study. First of all, Professor Carrick discovered that asymmetrically altering the afferent input to the thalamus resulted in an asymmetrical effect, asymmetrical effect on the size of the blind spot in each eye. This was attributed to an increase in brain function on the contralateral side due to changes in thalamocortical activation. We'll get into that in a second. That occurred because of multimodal sensory integration in thalamus. The stimulus utilized was a manipulation of the upper cervical spine, which is known to increase the frequency of firing of multimodal neurons in the areas of the thalamus and brainstem that protect the visual striate cortex. And again, this is referenced out of that neurology textbook I was talking about. And it's really important because what he's saying is the reason that blind spot got smaller was because we use one type of input. We use sensory input. We inputted the thalamus. And the thalamus is an egg deep within the brain where all sensory input except for smell goes through. Vision goes through it, hearing goes through it, taste goes through it, smell doesn't. But, but motion does, proprioception does. By using a proprioceptive stimulus, he inputted that thalamus. The thalamus as a whole began to fire at a higher central integrative state. And because of that, it was able to substitute in that visual deficit. And this is so neat to us because it says a lot of things. So first of all, what it says is that input in one receptor-based system can influence perception in another receptor-based system, right? If set touch, proprioceptive input, can alter vision, could it alter hearing? Could it alter Harvey Lillard's hearing? 
and that's what I think happened. I think BJ got lucky. I think or DD got lucky, and he afferented that thalamus. Thalamus got more effective. All of a sudden, that thalamus was functioning high enough for that input through the auditory nerve to actually pass through the thalamus into the temporal lobes for perception, and Harvey Lillard got his hearing back. So I think that's our first um, mechanism right there to understand that. The second really important thing that this says is that sightedness matters. It's not okay to do the atlas on both sides. It's not okay to do it on the wrong side because that will make the brain deficit worse. It's important to get on the right side. And we're also really interested in adjusting the atlas on the correct side. Because what happens if they have a right atlas and you adjust them on the left? subluxation gets bigger and their, neuro their nervous functioning gets worse, right? And this led me to a theory of tying in brain hemisphericity with atlas laterality. And I strongly believe there could be a correlation between the two of them. Right atlas, decreased left brain function, larger blind spot. It's something that we need to research into the future, okay? But sightedness matters. The last thing was that Carrick left this study kind of open-ended. He said, we don't know exactly why that blind spot got smaller. There's two possibilities. Possibility one, the adjustment created stimulation which caused an increased affrontation to that thalamus, which increased its central integrative state, right? We use a stimulus to cause activation to create short-term plasticity. Or was there a lesion that was causing that blind spot to be asymmetrical and the adjustment removed that lesion? And that is what caused it to go back to normal. Very interesting, very interesting, because he wasn't able to answer it. Nonetheless, he went with the first answer, it was stimulation. That's what he decided, and off of that, he built the realm of functional neurology. And functional neurology is all about trying to identify a breakdown in a pathway, use one type of sensory stimulus to input that pathway to get it to start firing better. But there's a problem with that, and the problem is that it's an allopathic approach because you're not identifying the cause of that weak pathway. And so if you don't identify the cause of the weak pathway, you just come up with a therapy that can mask it, the pathway will always be weakened, and you'll have to do that therapy for the rest of your life. Nobody wants to do therapies for the rest of their life, okay? Because therapies range from visual stimulation to spinning to adjustments to smelling different candles. Like, it's all over the place. But it's an allopathic approach, and I didn't go for it because I believe that the null hypothesis was true. I believe that there was a subluxation in that person's neck. He removed the subluxation, which normalized function, and that created proper input into the brain, and that's what brought the the brain back to balance. Very different there. And because of that, I'm going to work on reinforcing that, that the subluxation is real, that it causes problems in brain function. Okay? Now what's ve very interesting is that if the subluxation really is the cause of the brain hemisphericity, then upper cervical care is the most logical treatment for brain hemisphericity. And the entire care program was designed around balancing brain hemisphericity. We don't have time to get into brain hemisphericity today, but if we really were able to correct that through upper cervical care, as I'm postulating today, then the effects of our treatment get much more profound. And the ability of, our, of us to correct many different things also really increases exponentially. But what we've been talking about brings us to a couple quotes that I learned in the program. So, neuronal stabilization, brain activity results from the synaptic integration of all modes of incoming information. All that input is going to what makes the brain work. And changes in the level of this integrated activity should in turn change the level of the, act of the cerebral cortex. What we're talking about, if you had a bad stimulus, brain can't properly metabolize all the stimulus, then the brain starts acting wonky. And it's through these mechanisms that long-term potentiation is a complex now, there's also negative effects of altered proprioception. Patterns of normal proprioceptive input are profoundly distorted when articular nociceptive activity is added. When there's pain coming out of a joint, that pain 
pain is going to fire into different parts of the nervous system, and that's going to alter reflexes at that level. Okay? This interference with the precise continuous input necessary for coordinated multi-segmental reflexes are required for normal patterns of motion, balance, coordination, and equilibrium. And this is why we're trying to say if there's an injured joint which is sending nociceptive information into the brain, that pain is actually toxic to the functioning of the brain at regulating different, different functions, motion, balance, coordination. An injured joint is likely to cause persistently disturbed sensory feedback to the central nervous system, and therefore existing motor programs have to be modified. And I guess the best way to really understand that is with an elbow. So if this joint in the elbow is not working right and there's pain signals coming out of that, the pain is going to fire into the spinal cord and that will inhibit the muscles around it so that you can actually move the arm as much because the joint is injured. So there's joint nociception altering motion. Makes sense. This produces interdependence between biomechanical and neurological mechanisms. And so when we start really digging into how important these joints are, how important this proprioceptive input is, it leads us to this study, which every single upper cervical doctor should know very, very well. A quantitative study of muscle spindles and suboccipital muscles of human fetuses done in India. And basically, these doctors were using staining techniques to count how many muscle spindles were found in the upper cervical suboccipital muscles and what they found was 242 muscle spindles per gram of muscle tissue in the inferior obliquus. And that's the highest content of muscle spindles per gram of muscle tissue found in the entire human body. For one reason or another, our biology decided that it was very important to invest a lot of receptors right in those muscles. It's a very important joint for a lot of different reasons. I think it's the most important joint because it's the most heavily monitored through receptors. Make sense? Our brain pays more attention to the mechanics of this joint than any other part of our body. Let's talk about muscle spindles for one second, okay? We might remember them from school, it might be a long time, but we have these muscle spindles that live within the muscle itself, and their job is to detect stretch. So, when a muscle is stretched, the muscle spindle also gets stretched, and since it fires off to stretch, it has a very high frequency of firing. It's going bup, 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 bup. But when that muscle is shortened, that muscle spindle is also shortened, and now it's not going to fire off as quickly, and though it has a bup, 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 a decreased frequency of firing. And so if we apply this understanding of basic muscle spindle physiology and we take a look at the oh, one more. In the case of certain types of receptors in the upper cervical spine, as little as a 0.4 degree change of arc has been shown to cause activation. Again, coming from the textbook, 0.4 degrees is enough to, to alter these muscle spindle reflexes in the upper cervical spine, whereas the majority of the body is actually closer to 1%. But we see this. This is an upper cervical subluxation. Okay, Somebody is 20. They dive into the pool head first, smash their head on the bottom. They get out. They feel fine. And then they walk around like that for 20 years. And there's a big problem with that. Because the most sensitive muscle in your entire human body, this inferior obliquus, lives right here. And then it lives right here. And there's problems when you live like that. Problems with a static length receptors, okay? Different types of receptors in those muscle spindles are gonna fire off statically, even if you're not moving, just to tell the brain the length of those. So even if you're laying in bed not moving, but your head is crooked and this one is lengthened, this will have an increased frequency of firing, and this inferior oblique will have a lower frequency of firing. That's when you're not moving. Now when you're walking, it's even more profound because if you take a step and you turn and you stretch it, this one's going to fire off higher, that one fires off lower, and every step you take begins asymmetrical affrontation into the brain through this upper cervical complex. Now, the truth is, is that there's 
I tried to do the math on it. I calculated about 24 million different types of misalignments, the way we look at it, the way we measure it. Okay? There's a lot of different variations in misalignments. No person has the same one. That's why we go through all of this x-ray analysis to understand it. But because of that, some people might have a C2 that's rotated this way, which is really stretching that guy. Or this one could be really stretched and that one's short, or they could be all over the place. But either way, their subluxation is going to have a unique effect on the asymmetrical firing of their muscle spindles. And because of that, it's impossible to really predict how this subluxation is going to disafferentate their downstream neuronal pools and affect their quality of life. We can't apply allopathy to the upper cervical complex because we can't really predict the outcomes of a misalignment because there's too many receptors, too many nerves. Okay. But when we do our procedure and we do our best to restore them towards orthogonality, we balance these muscle lengths and then they have balance input back into the brain. Okay? Now, one more thing I want to add to this is that let's say this inferior oblique is shortened and those muscle spindles aren't firing off as frequently, okay? There are pools, neuronal pools downstream that are reliant on information from this very important constant stimulus pathway, they receive less in from input. And because they are not being stimulated as frequently, they have less immediate early gene responses, they start to lose protein manufacture, and they begin to go through transneural degeneration on the understimulated side. Now, this side, which is stretched, which is firing off way too frequently, is having way too much input to that side of the brain. And what that causes is actually aberrant neuroplasticity changes. That part's getting too much stimulation, that pathway is getting fired too off too much, and it starts to go through neuroplasticity when it shouldn't. It becomes too efficient, and you enter the state of neurologic windup, where one side of the brain is wound up from too much stimulation, the other side's wound down, transneurally generated from the lack of stimulation. To know what's going to happen, how this manifests in the human body, we need to understand the postsynaptic pools to the upper cervical complex. Where is this information actually going? We'll decide what areas are going to get messed up by it. Okay? Altered functional activity in muscle spindles can contribute to asymmetries in cortical afferent input, resulting in hemispheric activity. Okay, another quote coming from the textbook reinforces everything I said, but it's not just this crazy guy up here saying it, it's actually published. Okay. This is going to go back to the suboccipital muscle spindle research. This is page two, and there's a lot of really important gems on this page that we need to point out. The first one is that studies in humans have shown that the spindle density is highest in the hand, the foot, and the neck muscles, lower in the shoulder and thigh, Okay, medium and more distal muscles of the arm. So. Again, it's saying that the highest spindle density is going to be in this upper cervical. Hands are so important. They're very receptor laden. The reason why is because they're our primary tool as human beings. All right? Same with feet, because they tell us where we are in space. So there's a lot of receptors there. On the other hand, the majority of rotational movements of the head on the neck occur around the atlantoaxial joint. Okay? All this, that's just C1 on top of C2. That's where all that movement's coming from. And the inferior oblique muscle, which is diagonally inserted from the spine to the axis, would be subjected to stretch during almost the entire rotational movement at that. And that's what it's saying is whenever you rotate your head, that's the muscle that you're altering its, its length on. But you understand that these suboccipital muscles are very, very small muscles. On the other hand, they're very small. And they seem incapable of bringing around any significant head rotation. Moreover, they're inserted very close to the craniovertebral joints. And they're obviously at a mechanical disadvantage as compared to large, powerful rotators of the head, like the trapezius, the splenius, the SCM. And the role of these muscles as rotators is doubtful. Okay? These suboccipital muscles are not contracting to turn your head around. The SCM is the one that's contracting to turn your head around. And what it means is that these suboccipital muscles, we shouldn't be viewing them as 
muscles that create movement. There are really more muscles that are designed as a sensory organ to tell you where your head is in space. We've always been thinking about these muscles the wrong way. We should start thinking about them like an eyeball or an earball, but for a proprioceptive system. <laughs> okay, let's change our thinking on that. But we look at bones all day, so you can't blame us. It's a great paper, Clinical Characteristics of Cervicogenic Related Dizziness and Vertigo. Um, the paper starts off talking about how 20%, it's a, one of the top 20 most common reasons people go to see doctors is because they're dizzy or they're unstable. About half of those actually become vertigo. But if we look at cervical vestibular integration, we blow it up, there's a lot of good stuff in here. The vestibular apparatus in the inner ear directs velocity acceleration and position of the head, okay? But only with movement. The only time whenever we move our head, we have these little canals within our ears, they fire off and they tell you your head just rotated left, okay? And they work together with this upper cervical to tell you where your head is moving. Other motion inputs to the vestibular system, including position sense, especially cervical proprioceptin and visual stimulus. All of this is going to go into the vestibular nucleus, but the cerebellum is working hand in hand with that vestibular nucleus to clean it up. And that's what the cerebellum does, is it processes information and it modifies it and refines it. That's the job of the cerebellum. Now these redundant inputs are integrated by a central processor, vestibular nucleus, drives the eyes and the bodies, blah, 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 blah. But the integrated perception of head rotation in space can be disturbed and inaccurate if the input streams do not agree. We're going to get to this in the next slide, but what it's saying is that this vestibular nucleus has a lot of really important jobs, and it's going to take in input from three different areas. It's going to take input from the eyes, it's going to take input from the inner ears, and it's going to take input from the upper cervical spine, and it's going to cross-reference all of those together to try to determine where we are in space. And if one is saying something, one input saying something, and another input saying another thing, and they're not agreeing, you're going to interfere with integration, central processing in that vestibular system. It's a big problem. Okay, now somatosensory signals by themselves can generate vertigo. The cervico-ocular reflex movement depends purely from neck torsion. And this is what's neat, is there's a cervico-ocular reflex. What that means is that if I want to look at a target, I need to be able to fixate my eyes on that target. If I can't keep my eyes on the target, then I don't know where I'm in space, and I'm gonna be doing this, I'm gonna titubate, okay? And so the large part of neurology is about restoring eye movement control. It's a very large part of the functional neurology program. And what they say is that if I'm going to turn my head to the left, my eyes need to go equally to the right to keep them focused on that target. If they fall off that target, then my head titubates. I don't know where I am in space. So they do a series of vestibular canal to ocular eye reflexes or exercises to try to rehab that pathway. But there's an exact similar pathway of the eyes in relationship to movement of the neck. And that's what's very interesting is that we are the only people that are actually rehabbing the cervico-ocular reflex by fixing joint mechanics between C1 and C2. Awesome. Yeah, isn't that pretty neat? And I postulate that if we could use the vestibular ocular reflex therapies in conjunction with this upper cervical, we would have the most comprehensive vestibular treatment program on the planet, which is pretty unique to upper cervical care alone. But that's really important. Um, he talks about CORs, cervical ocular reflexes, a little bit. But it takes me to this slide, and this is what I was saying. Here's your vestibular nucleus getting input from the upper cervical spine, from the inner ear canals, and from the eyes. But the eyes are, the, I think, the least important part, because you can mess with that and be OK. There was some Swiss researchers, and what they were doing was they had upside down glasses. They had glasses you put on, flip the whole world upside down, and they, they tried to wear them for like a week. And they were pretty dizzy on day one. They didn't know where they were. But by day two, 
they had already compensated for it. They were in total perfect movement. They had total perfect balance, even though they were seeing the world upside down. And because that visual activity, the brain was able to compensate for that. And so I don't really think that an aberrancy in visual input is going to mess up your vestibular nucleus. If it really did, then all blind people would have like crazy scoliosis. And it's not true at all. These are the two major players that are going to input this vestibular nucleus and determine its functioning. And if they do not agree, then the processing within that nucleus becomes aberrant. And that can have a lot of changes on human health. A lot of changes, OK? The first one is that it's going to go to control of the eyes. Okay, it's going to say that, yeah, when you turn your head left, the eyes need to go equal amount right. So if that vestibular nucleus isn't functioning properly, then you'll have af or bad input to this extraocular motor control, and your eyes are going to be wobbly. You can't control your eyes. And this frustrates me because Carrick Program is always trying to retrain the eyes to move when you really just need to get to the, the core cause of it, the source of it. Uh, that's also going to go up to the brain to tell us where we are in space. If that doesn't work, then we're going to feel dizzy. We're going to feel nauseous. We might get vertigo. We might be unsteady. We might have balance issues. All the things we, we see in the clinic and things we're planning on studying later. But the last one, most important one to us, is the output of the vestibular nucleus through the vestibular spinal tract to the spinal networks. So what this guy is doing is it sends nerves down through the vestibular spinal tract, through the spinal cord, to activate our anti-gravity postural muscles. The little tiny muscles on the sides of your spine, there's hundreds of them, that you can't think about or consciously control, all of those are going through subconscious control through the vestibular spinal tract. And what happens is that when the output of this nucleus becomes aberrant, and it has aberrant activity to the spinal networks, you get a twisting of the skeleton, a, a, a twisting. We've seen that, right? We've all seen that. We're going to get into it. So here's a paper by the Vestibular Disorders Association saying that cervicogenic dizziness is a real diagnosis. It actually happens. It validates somebody could be dizzy because of their neck. Not because of a problem in their inner ears, but because of something in their neck. So it's a real diagnosis. Here's the evidence for that. Here's another one through Oxford talking about cervical contribution to vertigo. Cervical vertigo is a real syndrome. It's a real diagnosis. It actually exists. Here's evidence within the medical field saying what we already say and reinforcing us. Not working against us, but working with us. But this, this is what we see every day, right? Is that when their atlas is out and it's inputting that vestibular nucleus wrong, the central integrative state changes, its aberrant output becomes weird, they get all twisted up. Their spine gets all twisted up. And that hip raises and it pulls that leg short. And that's why we do our leg checks. Because this is really a manifestation of poor vestibular processing. We fix the atlas, which normalizes functioning in the vestibular nucleus, and the legs balance out even. But this can create problems anywhere in the body, right? Okay, people say, Doc, I got low back pain. I can say, I see, you're twisted up, right? Or they say, I got shoulder pain. And I say, well, look at that. That shoulder's lagging way down low. And every time you reach for something with tilted shoulders, you're giving yourself an overuse injury because your posture is off, because the vestibular nucleus has interfered with their posture. We go ahead, we get the head on straight, we normalize neuronal pools, and their output becomes normal, and things start to shift back towards neutral, which is really neat for us. And the second thing that's really important is that at the apex of this curve, maybe it's L2, maybe it's L3, whatever it is, that's a put, that's the area that's going to have the most disturbed biomechanics, and that's going to be viewed as an L3 subluxation. And you can go ahead and you can, you know, drop on it and blow it up and restore it to normal biomechanics for about an hour until the real cause of the problem twists them back up into that posture, and L3 is out again. And it needs to be adjusted two, three times a week for the rest of their life because you're never dealing with the cause of the problem. Does that make sense? Cool. OK, cool. So um, I think this actually really explains why we see successes with low back pain, why we see successes with neck pain, why we see successes with shoulder issues, is because we're balancing the vestibular system. 
I've um, kind of thought that if we could prove that we change leg length and that alone, it would be a tremendous landmark for upper cervical because there's a lot of medical doctors really focused on leg length inequality. It's a big problem. There's a paper talking about biomechanical implications of mild leg length inequality. And what do they say? If you got a short leg, it's going to mess with your gait, basically. And you see people walking around like this, they've got a short leg. And if you can get those legs to go balanced through whatever, whatever method you choose, it's going to improve their gait function, which will take strain off the musculoskeletal system. And, and there's doctors doing this. They're using a heel lift to make those legs go even, and they're seeing scoliosis is reduce. Okay, this is seeing a change in spinal when you change the length of the legs. Now, I think what's interesting is that the research is kind of inconclusive about relating a leg length discrepancy to a problem because they're trying to say leg length causes uh, low back pain, and the research on that's actually pretty unclear controversy about the effects of leg length discrepancy on low back pain. Some studies show that people with lib length discrepancies have a greater incidence of low back pain and others don't. Some people have a short leg and they got low back pain. Some people got a short leg and they got mid thoracic. It, it, it's different on different people. Everybody's a unique human being so um, you can't really tie it in with that all the time. But what's also interesting about this, this little blurb I found on the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is that they found differences in leg lengths in about, um, I think it's 32% of people had a short leg greater than a, a quarter inch. So maybe that is a glimpse into the significance of the upper cervical, how many people are actually walking around with a misalignment. Who really knows? Management of leg length inequality found on Medscape. They're basically saying that it's going to alter your gait if one leg is shorter or longer, and it can cause a lot of problems in the body. And so it's really important to have those legs even. And if they don't know um, what's causing that leg to be short, there's ways of making it longer. <laughs> yeah, that looks really comfortable. <laughs> I mean, uh, they go ahead and saw that fibula in half, pried apart, and screwed all together. I mean, the, the rate of implications from a procedure like this are tremendous, but they're desperate to get those legs balanced sometimes, and they're willing to resort to things like this. So I think, um, A, if we could prove that we balance leg lengths alone, it would be huge for us, okay? There's two different types of short legs. There's a structural short leg, and then there's a functional short leg. We deal a lot with functional short legs. Legs. The leg looks like it's short because muscles are tight. Other ones, the bone could actually be shorter. Okay, the hip could be messed up. Really easy way to tell if it's structural or functional. Have them turn their head both ways. If it goes even, it's functional. If it stays short, no matter how they turn their head, it's a structural one. If it's a structural one, I think give them a heel lift because you'll never get that even through functional changes if it's structurally short. But the vast majority of these, they're functional. That vast majority of these legs drop right even after we adjust them and stay even as long as they maintain that adjustment. Um, these are pictures taken out of the upper cervical subluxation book, the textbook by Kirk Erickson. Some really great pictures showing pre's and posts. Pre, you got a straight neck. Post, you got that curve coming back in. Pre, straight, post, great curve coming back in. And I think, again, this is um, validation of rehabilitation through that vestibular vestibular system, increasing the central integrative state in that vestibular system. And these are really beautiful, too, because, I mean, this is a low back, right? This is L5. I mean, they're adjusting somewhere up here, 24 segments north of that, and they're creating all these global changes in the base of the spine. And this is, you know, does this person have low back pain walking around like that? Probably. You betcha. Does this look better? Does that feel better? Yeah, absolutely. Again, changes through the vestibular program. There's another paper that's really important. Dr. Murphy talks about it called The Intermediates of the New Medulla, Potential Site for Integration of Cervical Information and the Generation of Autonomic Responses. And right here is the key. 
the nucleus intermedius sends monosynaptic projections to both the nucleus tractus solitarius and the hypoglossal nucleus. It's likely that the nucleus intermedius acts to integrate information from the head and neck and relays this information to the NTS where suitable autonomic responses can be generated, also to the hypoglossal nucleus to influence movements of the tongue and upper airways, essential to the integrator, blah, 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 blah. But something's very important because it says monosynaptic projections. And if you look back in this textbook, I've been talking about monosynaptic connections between two su structures suggests a very important functional relationship between the two structures. If it's only going to synapse one time, that's pretty important. Okay, If it synapses like 24 times before getting there, it's not as important. So because there's a monosynaptic connection between the upper cervical spine to this nucleus intermedius and from that to the nucleus tractus solitaris, this explains some of our changes with autonomic control, right? Because the nucleus tractus solitaris outputs through vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, to control all of our guts, okay? And so if the atlas is off-center, muscle spindles are distorted in their length, causing a disturbed frequency of firing into this nucleus intermedius. One will become higher in its central integrative state, one becomes lower, one goes through transdermal degeneration, one goes through aberrant plastic changes, and it interferes with the output of that nucleus tractus solitarius. Where does it, where does it go to? Cardiorespiratory controls. It goes to a lot of places, but cardiorespiratory control. Everybody's seen this research paper. This is a very famous blood, blood research paper done on blood pressure by Dick Holtz. You've seen this one, right? Everybody's seen this one. What does it say, like, hidden in there? Systolic, 17-point drop. That's tremendous. That's more effective than two blood pressure meds at the same time. And they maintain that drop for eight weeks off of one NUCA adjustment. Okay? I'm sure everybody whose practice has seen patients' blood pressure change. But this is what's happening. We're rehabilitating that nucleus intermedius, which is rehabilitating the nucleus tractus solitaris to properly control our autonomic responses. And it goes far beyond this, okay? It said hypoglossal restoration too, which is controlling neck and tongue. Maybe patients' tongues work better. I don't really look at it that often. But another research paper, which isn't the best done paper, but interesting one nonetheless, the CD4 one. They were measuring white blood cell counts in AIDS patients under upper cervical care, and they found that their white blood cells got way better after doing the upper cervical adjustment. And if you know anything about lymphocytes, you know that they have receptors on them for norepinephrine. Okay? When you're in a sympathetic state and you're firing off norepinephrine, that sympathetic receptor, that sympathetic neurotransmitter, it inhibits lymphocytes. They're not going to go and fight an infection when you're trying to get away from a bear. Okay? And when you've got this misalignment, which neurologically is like a claw gripping your brain stem, and it's interfering with that nucleus intermedius, and you're living in a sympathetic state, your, your immune system drops. And again, that's why I say that this might be the best flu shot we have. So uh, it's kind of neat. Now we have to talk about the trigeminal cervical nucleus as well. Do we have five minutes left? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the trigeminal cervical nucleus. Okay, the trigeminal nucleus, we learned about this one in school a long time ago, sometimes really, really long time ago. And uh, <laughs> a trigeminal nucleus basically dips all the way down into the spinal cord, all the way down. And so mechanoreceptors and nociceptors from the C1, C2, C3 vertebra are sending input into that trigeminal nucleus, and that's altering the frequency and firing in that nucleus, which can lead it closer to high functioning central and grave state or lower further away from it from subluxation model that we've created today and so what this can mean is that if you alter input to that nucleus and you change its integration its output can become aberrant okay what is its output to its output is through the temporalis muscle master muscle medial pterygoids all these muscles around the jaw and that's why we adjust somebody's atlas and their tmj gets better we're rehabbing that trigeminal nucleus 
other outputs are through the tensor tympani muscle, tensor villi palatini muscle. Tensor tympani muscle controls the tenseness on that tympanic membrane. So if this output is aberrant to this muscle, this person can get tinnitus. And it's one cause of tinnitus. There's multiple causes, but a lot of people whose tinnitus, ringing in the ears, gets better is through rehabilitation of, rehabilitation of this pathway through that muscle. Tensor villi palatini muscle controls the width of your eustachian tubes, and that's got a reflection of ear infections in children. How come their ear infections get better? So now we know why. Ding. Last one is periaqueductal gray matter, okay? <laughs> periaqueductal gray is really a neat part of the brain in the mesencephalon, top part of your brain stem. Its job is to inhibit all incoming pain from the body, super segmental inhibition of pain. If this guy fails and you can't inhibit any pain and you've got all this crazy pain signals actually passing straight through it to the brain, you get fibromyalgia. So you feel, you feel fibromyalgia pain. You feel pain everywhere, and they don't know what it is, so they just call it fibromyalgia. It's a blank diagnosis that really means nothing, but I think this is one of the truest mechanisms behind fibromyalgia, and it's great because uh, fibromyalgia patients, they do so well with upper cervical care. They, they get like a 50% reduction almost immediately, quite often, through rehabilitation of that periaqueductal gray. Okay, Nicholas Bogduk, great researcher. This guy's coming out of Australia in the neuroscience department, and he writes this paper called Cervicogenic Headache, an assessment of the evidence on cervical diagnosis, test, and treatment. And right here, the mechanism underlying the pain involves convergence between cervical and trigeminal afferents and that trigeminal nucleus. And in this nucleus, nociceptive afferents from C1, C2, C3 spinal nerves converge onto other neurons that receive input from adjacent places. Okay, this trigeminal nucleus is responsible for pain sensation of the entire skull, right? It's responsible for pain sensation of the whole skull. And so when you have this aberrant input to it from the upper cervical misalignment, it can interfere, it, those messages converge, and it be essentially becomes confused. And that's why, although you have a misalignment down here, you feel it as pain over here through referral mechanisms, okay? I'm very familiar with cervicogenic headaches. I had them for about 12 years. I got my atlas corrected, and I don't really get them anymore. So this is why, it's because we're removing that nociceptive afferent from that joint complex to help with these cervicogenic headaches. And we all know that this upper cervical work is usually a grand slam with those types of headaches. I actually view the headaches slightly differently. I view headaches as an early warning sign that there's probably a misalignment behind it. So if you know somebody with headaches, they probably got a misalignment. And the Canadian Memorial, what's the only thing that upper cervical is good for? <laughs> Cervicogenic headaches. Now we know why. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Bogduk is such a good researcher. He's so good. He wrote another paper, another paper talking about neck pain. And I love this paper because it's so great. What he does is he was like, let's talk about neck pain for a while. First, we need to identify what could be the source of neck pain. Okay, where is the neck pain coming from? And so they go through different research articles where they're injecting saline into joints. And if they inject saline into a joint and you damage that joint, you'll feel pain. So he basically, or, okay, or if you put an anesthetic into that joint, it takes away the neck pain. So he knows that the joints are the source of the neck pain. That's where the pain is being generated from, is from those joints. Then he says, what's causing it? And he starts going through different diagnoses. What's causing problems in that joint? Infection, eh, not very common, pretty rare. Tumor, very, very rare. Meniscoid blocks, very, very rare. Um, he goes through all the different documented causes of joint problems, and they're all extremely rare. And so he actually wraps up the paper saying this, a sober review of the purported causes of neck pain reveals that the most readily diagnosed and serious conditions are rare and don't account for most cases. Meanwhile, most commonly applied diagnosis lacks validity. They've been deproved, disproved by epidemiology or proper diagnosis, and there's really no data on the common cause of un uncomplicated neck pain. <laughs> we don't know what's causing it. <laughs> we just know it's coming from the joints. 
Um, something that he mentioned in this paper that I really, really liked was that he goes through great lengths to tell that arthritis does not cause pain. Okay, It's a pretty um, misunderstood concept. A lot of your patients come in, they say, it hurts here, I've got arthritis. That's what the doctor says. But it happened just last week. Okay, I'm doing a report of findings. I'm looking at his lateral x-ray. It is a disaster. There's grade five, you know, grade five arthritis everywhere. And I'm like looking at his card and he's coming in for low back pain. And I'm like, you don't have neck pain? He's like, no, nah, it's a little stiff, but no, no pain, <laughs> right? They did some giant studies. They took a bunch of people with neck pain. They did x-rays. Half of them had arthritis. Half of them didn't have arthritis. Then they took a bunch of x-rays of arthritis, asked them if they had neck pain. Half of them had neck pain. Half of them didn't have neck pain. Bogda concludes that arthritis is not the cause of neck pain. Cool. But he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what it is. He just knows it's not arthritis. So those are those are my neurologic mechanisms. I've got another dozen anatomical models of subluxation that most of us are familiar with, right? There's very unique anatomy that that sets it up for a lot of problems anatomically as well. You know, this is the mouth of God right there. Every single nerve. Just keep going. Are you guys okay if I keep going? Yes. Okay. This is this, we call this the mouth of God in chiropractic school because everything's going from the brain to the body goes straight through that, with exception of cranial nerves nine, ten, and eleven. Okay, those actually go through the foramen of the skull and they come down to the muscles in the neck. Okay, or the vagus nerve. So those don't actually go through that neural canal, but almost everything else does. So it's a pretty important hole, and. Um, it's really important that us as upper cervical doctors know our neuroanatomy. We know that this very first spinal nerve coming out of C1, it's all motor. There's no dorsal branch, there's no sensory, there's no sensitive C1 dermatome. That C1 nerve is 100% motor. Deep muscles of the neck, okay? C2 is a different story. C2 is actually sensory and motor. But when you look at this C2 nerve root, how it exits, it sets it up for problems as it exits between C1 and C2. Reason why is when we look at anatomic considerations, C2 nerve root ganglion, they found when they're measuring this ganglion that it's actually a really small little hole that that C2 nerve needs to exit out of. And normally, that, um, that C2 ganglion takes up 76% of the foramen height all by itself. So it actually makes it, renders a C2 ganglion vulnerable to entrapment. A C2 can become entrapped pretty easily because it's a big nerve coming out through a small hole. And uh, we see that every day with our, our scanning palpation. Here's the research that backs up our scanning palpation. It's good stuff, it's really good stuff. But if you can entrap that C2 dorsal nerve root, which is branching out to become that greater occipital nerve, what does your patient come in with? Occipital neuralgia, skull cap pain. I had one about three weeks ago, one adjustment, and it was gone. It was awesome. Really cool for her. Now, on the other hand, I had an older guy, very bad case of occipital neuralgia, quite a bit of compression there, really bad pain, and we actually weren't able to help him. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks, and I just couldn't get it fixed. And the reason why is because instead of being functionally weakened, the nerve was actually dead. It was dead. And when you can't bring a dead nerve back to life. If it's weakened, you can get pressure off it, it can start to get stronger again. But for him, it was actually dead. And I'll, I'll let him go. Actually, kind of, kind of sad. But we help a lot of people with, eh, not my thing. But um, that's the thing. We can help this nerve. Every time we do an adjustment, we decompress that nerve and that foramen, and it opens back up. Couldn't do an anatomical compression model without giving a little bit of credence to Grossick and the dentate cord. This is what we've been using for the last, I think, 70 years in upper cervical chiropractic. Basically, 
upper cervical spine is very interesting because the dura mater actually attaches to the periosteum of the bone. It doesn't do that in the rest of the spinal canal because the dura mater detaches from the bones and floats in there, surrounded by fat. But when it comes to the upper cervical spine, that dura mater is completely attached to the, C, to the occiput. Skip C1, actually, but attached to the outside of C2 and C3. So when you have this twisting of those bones, twisting of the dura mater, it's putting these asymmetrical pulling on those dentate ligaments. And I was listening to Kirk Erickson last week on the subluxation summit. He talks about how the dentate ligaments in the upper cervical spine are by far the strongest and sturdiest of all the dentate ligaments in the rest of the spine. And what happens is when one dentate ligament is pulling on the side of the core, you get these waves of compression coming into that upper cervical cord waves of compression and what happens is these compressions squeeze the capillary beds and you lose oxygenation to these ascending and descending motor tracts and you can get pain in other parts of your body essentially and um, interesting is right here on this lateral part of the core is the spinocerebellar tract which is bringing up proprioceptive information for the rest of the body and that can be interfered with through this dentate mechanism okay we all know that one already there's your vertebral artery coming up the neck through the atlas round to become that basilar artery. Basilar artery insufficiency is very well noted in the research. It exists. Could an anterior rotation of this atlas cause compression right there? Yeah, by f absolutely, okay? Here's one of our patients we saw here at the clinic. Um, he basically, when he would turn his head, he'd almost pass out. And the reason why is you can see his carotid arteries look great on this MRA. Carotid artery looks great there. Here's his vertebral artery coming up, coming up through the atlas, round into the skull to become that basilar artery. Coming up, coming up. What's going on right there? Blockage. Blockage. Blockage of that vertebral artery right around the posterior condyle. And um, again, there's a patient, he was, he was a struggle, and we helped him a little bit, but this was what was causing his problem. And it's crazy when you get an MRA report that says normal, and you can see that. So it's crazy. Cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, a very big thing coming out in upper cervical research. You guys need to see Scott Rosa to really justify the explanation of this, but there's a lot of things that say, because we're upright human beings, the foramen magnum's on the base of the skull, okay? For the majority of animals, dogs, horses, foramen magnum's on the back of the skull. And so because we're upright human beings, gravity can pull the brain lower into that foramen magnum, whereas it's not the same effect with animals because uh, foramen magnum's in the back. And what happens is these people get into these car accidents where their head goes flying and their spinal cord which is anchored to their coccyx isn't going to go much further so it stays right there but their head goes further and it plugs that hole pulls that cerebellum down into that foramen magnum and plugs it it's a very big problem because this is a very important gateway where you're supposed to have cerebral spinal fluid exiting the skull and the ventricles to supply nourishment to the cord what happens when you do that well first of all he found that these Chiari malformations, they're much more common when you're upright, okay? All the time we take a, a car accident patient, we do a supine MRI, and it looks normal. That cerebellum's way up there. But then we do an upright MRI, and boom, there's that cerebellum sitting in the middle of that foramen magnum, plugging it like a cork. Uh, the incidence jumps up. In the, in the post-traumatic groups, the, the trauma groups, when they're supine, 5.3 of them have these, but when they're upright, it jumps up to about 23%. So they're very common, actually. Very common that people are getting these after these traumas where that starts to herniate. But the problem is that's gonna interfere with cerebral spinal fluid hydrodynamics. Great research paper, about 33 pages long, but it's written by Demadian. Demadian's the guy that invented the MRI, right? And he's the one behind this research saying, we're finding a higher incidence of CTE, all right, cerebral, um, or Chiari-like malformations, okay, but acquired Chiaris. True Chiari you're born with. These are acquired trauma-related Chiaris, and they're very common in these groups, and it's interfering with hydrodynamics in the brain, how that cerebral spinal fluid is draining, which causes pressure changes in the brain, which can lead to multiple sclerosis, right? Chronic cerebral venous insufficiency in patients with MS. These MS patients are having difficulty draining the brain out. 
because something's going on near the cranio-cervical junction. And then this other group re very recently in Italy did this study um, where they were actually measuring laterality. They would do an open mouth and they would measure right or left and its influence on cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, the ability of the brain to drain. And they found that the people with a right laterality or an anterior intrusion had a higher incidence of problems draining the brain and a higher incidence of multiple sclerosis. What happens? You adjust their atlas. If you're lucky, that cerebellum pops back up into the skull. Cerebral spinal fluid can properly drain out of the brain. Pressure goes back to normal. And the multiple sclerosis lesions you see on the MRIs disappear almost instantly on a pre and post MRI, depending on, upon the chronicity and other factors. So uh, I think that we're like the up and coming next best bet for multiple sclerosis patients. And there's a lot of case studies out there showing we can knock it out of the park with them too. So what does this all mean? What does this all mean? It means that what we do is very powerful. It affects the human body in a really profound way. It's incredible to know why they got better when you adjusted their atlas, and there's a lot of mechanisms to explain why. The truth is in any one patient coming in with a misalignment, of these 10 different mechanisms we talked about, one could be affecting them, seven could be affecting them. We don't know. We don't really know how they're being affected from that misalignment. All we know that's interfering with their life, but you can't tell the patient all the the stuff I told you today because you'll lose them. <laughs> it's a really hard subject I learned. I came out of school, I came here all fired up, ready to tell some neurology, and like the patient, what? Like, they don't get it. They don't get it. But for me to say pinch nerves feels wrong in my heart, knowing what I know. So I came up with essentially. <sighs> Yeah, pinch nerves on top of your neck. I, I couldn't have done this presentation without the, the love and support of my partner, who's been there even when I come home late. He never judges me. Um, always end a neurology presentation with a fancy picture of the brain. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>